All right, welcome back. This is Computer Science S75. I'm Chris Gerber, and tonight I'll be covering Section 5. We're going to talk about PDO, uh, some more SQL commands, talking about join, index, and commit, and we'll get into a little bit more of the detail around Project 1. Hopefully everyone's doing well with Project 0. You're uh, moving along. You're ready to turn things in Wednesday. Uh, we'll give you the instructions Tuesday night on how to actually proceed with that. Well, let's get started. To, uh, to kick things off, I'd actually like to do a little refresher about how we have been working. So let me bring up a bit of code. All right, so what we're going to look at first is just a little bit of how we have been working with databases in PHP. So you'll see this is the model that I'm working on as, as I begin to work on my implementation of Project 1. I've got a, a few definitions up front just to make things easy and so I have a single point where I can configure things. I've defined my host, my user, my password, and my database all with the define command. So I've basically set up, it's not quite available, uh, a variable, it's actually a constant. So I can use these later in my code. So if down the road I actually change the account name or the password, I'm just changing it in one spot. So let's move a little further down the code. So this is basically the approach we were taking before. We've got, you can skip the first few lines, but we set up a connection. We used MySQL connect. I had a host name, username, and password. We would then select the database with MySQL select DB. And then we were using things like sprintf to take a query, fill in the blanks automatically, and build up the statement so that we could then do, for example, an MS MySQL query to actually get back some data. So this is where we were just a few days ago. Does this all basically seem familiar so far? All right. All right, so looking at this, this rough idea, what can tell me, who can tell me what's potentially good or bad about what I've done so far here? Is there anything that jumps out that seems promising, disappointing? Sure. So the first thing pointed out was that we actually encrypted the password. We're using a password hash. We're using SHA1. So that was something that had come up in lecture, and uh, certainly that's one of the things I wanted to incorporate. So that's a great one. What else did uh, people notice from my code so far? All right, so one thing I might throw out there. I've got this function, login user. And I'm connecting to the database and selecting the database. And that's probably something I'm going to do a lot. So that's something where I might want to consider, does it make sense to put it in these individual functions and repeat that code over and over? Or do I maybe want to factor that out to some higher point in the code? So that's something to consider. Uh, anything else? I'll point out that we also use the uh, MySQL escape string on the email because I didn't really know where that was coming from and I just want to make sure it's safe when it's coming in. All right, and then one of the other things is something that David just started talking about tonight. When we start looking at this code, I've got all these MySQL specific commands. So what's the problem with these MySQL specific commands? Right, so the answer was, and it's a great answer, if in the future I want to use something other than MySQL, I've pretty much locked myself in. So that's why we're going to start talking about PDO tonight. The other thing I'd like you to keep in mind as we look at this is that sprintf command, where I've basically built this query once. I take the parameters and I build the, a unique string and I'm going to pass that one string into the database. So let's switch over to the slides. 
So actually, I had one other thing I wanted to talk about related to this. We've talked about indexes. You know, one of the key reasons we use indexes are to improve performance at the cost of using some additional storage. So just as a refresher, we've got the create index command. You can specify that they're unique. You specify the table and the columns that are going to be used. When we look at our code, we had talked about this in the example before. We've got the email and the password. And we're going to be querying these over and over. But really, if you start looking at the statement I built up here, it's probably more likely that ID is actually the field that is, I've set up as a primary key. The fact that we're going to continually query against email and password actually implies to me that I might want to create an index that uses both those fields so that every time I'm authenticating someone against the database, that performance is going to be improved. So something to consider as you're working through your project. All right. So now I want to jump over and talk about PDO. We, we want to start leaving behind this idea of these, these MySQL statements. Not that they're bad, but we can do better. So PDO is PHP data objects. It provides a data access abstraction layer, but it does not provide a database abstraction layer. So basically, the difference there is we don't have to learn a new set of PHP commands to talk to our databases. No matter what we change on the back end, if it's MySQL, Oracle, whatever, we're still using the same PHP commands. But whatever we pass in through the PHP commands, a select statement, an insert, an update, a delete, those commands are not going to get translated. So if you're using a specific set of SQL commands that are specific to your database, those do not change. So if you start using custom functionality, for example, if I was going to do a create table through PHP, and I'm going to use MySQL, we talked tonight about using InnoDB could be one of your database options. Oracle is not going to know anything about that. So if I remap the commands and use Oracle as the back end, the PHP part will stay the same, those commands will be the same, but the actual create table command will have to be edited because this functionality, PDO, doesn't know how to automatically make those translations. One of the other nice things about PDO, we mentioned some of the uh, different drivers that are available. Some of the platforms out there are Informix, MS SQL, MySQL, Oracle, SQLite. So certainly plenty of options, which is really nice as well. All right. So let's actually see what some of this starts to look like. Get out of my code. So I created a very simple example, basic idea of a select statement using PDO. So we can start, I've just sort of spelled it out in one big command to get started, but I'm creating a database handle, dollar sign dbh, so starting here, equals new PDO. So I'm actually creating an object, and it's a PDO object, and I'm passing it some parameters. The first parameter is the DSN, which I don't off the top of my head remember what the acronym is for, but basically what it tells it is the type of database you're connecting to, the host that it's on, and which database in that host you're going to use. So I've specified MySQL for the database type, I've specified localhost as my host, and I've specified a database name a uh, database name of jharvard underscore section 5, which should feel familiar from all the work we've seen in PHP MySQL so far, PHP MyAdmin. And then the next two parameters are the user and the password. And we've certainly seen jharvard as the user and crimson as the password plenty of times this semester. The next thing I'm going to do is just a simple query. I take the database handle, and I tell it I'm going to do a query, and I've got a very simple query statement here. Select star from students. 
We all know what that does, straightforward. I'm gonna take the results and put it into a variable called dollar sign students. As you might guess, this is going to be an array. So I can, as we go to the bottom of the screen here, use a for each to iterate across that, taking each element out of students and calling it a student. And then I can print the various fields. So one thing you'll see here is I suddenly have ID first and last available. And what's happening is PDO is actually looking at the column names in the table and making those the keys for my associative array so that I can pull the values out. So student is the row, ID is the column, it's mapped that into an associative array element and will automatically pull out the value. And then we're done, when we're done, just for good measure, I've set the uh, database handle to null, which essentially closes the connection. So we can actually see what this does. Before I actually kick off this command, one thing I want to point out is, for the bulk of this course, we've actually been running PHP through the web server. But PHP is just a standard scripting language. When you execute it, you can specify that the output is going out through, for example, through Apache, out through the web server, but you can actually run these commands from the command line as well and just see the output. So I've actually, I'm gonna do that right here. And you can see that it's going into my database. I've previously set up a small table. I've got a column ID. It's the primary key. It's just um, an int. One, two, three, auto-incremented. I've got a first name and a last name. And it's pulled out those records and printed them to the screen for me. So just as a very quick overview of PDO, does that basically make sense so far? Okay, great. So as we start looking into PDO, You'll see a few standard things. We've got the DSN, which we mentioned, and the DBH database handle that we mentioned. There are basically five statements that are sort of my wheelhouse when I'm using PDO. Query executes the statement and returns a result set. That's what we just saw. Exec executes the statement, but instead of returning the results, it just tells you the number of rows that were impacted. So if you were doing an update operation and you expected three rows to be updated, you could determine if that actually happened, if, for example, zero were updated. You could start to get a sense as to was the command successful based on what you expected the count to be. Prepare, bind value, and execute get a little more interesting. So what pre prepare does is it lets us pre-prepare a statement for execute, execution on the database. So that actually gives us several advantages. First of all, it's letting the database know up front we're going to do this work and let it do a bulk of the work up front to get ready. It knows what tables it's going to need. It knows basically the approach that it's going to take to query the data. And then we can specify parameters. And we can use those parameters to then tweak the query. So we might be selecting with a parameter of ID equals fill in the blank. And then I can say, run this query with a one, run this query with a two, run this query with a three. And the database doesn't have to go through the full process of building the instruction each time. It just has to rerun the same query with the new value. To do that, we're going to use the bind value command, which takes one of the parameters and inserts the value that we want to use into it. And then once we've prepared it and bound it, we actually use execute, as opposed to exec, execute spelled out, to actually run the statement. So why do we do this? Basically, there are two really good reasons. Performance, first off. The pre preparation is performed once, so the database can do that work, and it doesn't have to repeat it every time we're going to execute the command. And then, you know, parameters can have new values bound at each execution as well, which is great. The other advantage is security. As David mentioned earlier tonight, by using 
these parameters, we actually get the, the work of escaping the parameters done for us up front. So we don't have to remember to do our MySQL real prepare, whatever the whole statement was. You don't have to remember that even. You just have to know that as long as you're using these parameters, it's going to take care of that for you. So let's see what that looks like. So I had shown you my table of students with myself and David and Elaine. I've also got a table of grades that I had pre-created. And what I want to do is fill in a number of values. So I've created this array that has the data that I want to load into the database. The first value is the ID number of the student. The second value is the project number they were working on. And the third value is the grade that they got on the project. And I just want to bulk load this data into the database. You can see I've set up my connection to the database on the, as the last line here. But let's see how we might actually go through this process using parameters. All right. Just to make it cleaner for myself, I start off by deleting from grades. So anything that wasn't there, I'm getting rid of. Next, I can prepare this statement. We want to insert into grades. Grades was the table. The columns are going to be student, project, and grade. And we want to fill in values. And you can see what I've done here is I've got colon student, colon project, and colon grade. So basically what I've done is named the parameters. These are the blanks that I want to fill in, and these are the names I want to use to fill them in with. Now you could actually use question mark for each one, and then just remember the position of each question mark, but I find using the full name is actually a little more clear. Then I've created a loop here to insert all these grades. At each point, I'm going to bind a value to the appropriate parameter, and then I can execute the query. So the first time through the loop, I take those first elements out of the array, and I bind them to student, project, and grade. And then I can execute the command and loop around to the next item. The other thing that's interesting here is this last set of parameters. Now, what does that look like to folks? Sure. Uh, integers and strings. Exactly. So what I can do is I can actually Sorry, it was integers and strings. What I can actually do is tell the database in advance what types of fields these are as well, which will help it with the process of making sure that the data that's being bound in, bound in is appropriate for the fields, so that I don't try to take a string and cram it into an integer, or it will know that it actually has to do formatting appropriately to make that happen. Those parameter types are actually optional, but I certainly recommend it as a if nothing else, good clarity to yourself as to what you're expecting to be happening. And then at the very end of this example, I just do a, another query of the database, the same code as before, just so we can display the results. I'm using the grades table instead of the students table, but the concept is the same. So let's see how this actually works. So you see it's, it's gone through, and it's entered the data from that array directly into the table, queried it back out. Relatively straightforward. So you can select a series of columns from a table name. There's a number of options here, and I'll come back to that. Join to a second table name based on some conditions. So we've got left, right, outer, inner. What, what does all this mean? Basically, we have inner joins, or we have left or right outer joins. There's also full outer joins, which we'll, we'll hint at, but uh, we won't go into a lot of details there. So let's see one of these. So starting with inner join, I've got two tables. And these are the tables that we've been talking about. We've got students, Chris, David, Elaine. We've got grades, 
with student number, project, and grade. I moved the ID column in the first table to the right just so you can see that ID and student go together and you can sort of see how things might line up there. With an inner join, what we're going to see is a result like this. It's basically going to look for every place on the left where the, it can find an ID number that has a matching number on the right and display those records. So for an ID of one, it goes over, it sees student is in the first and second rows, and it brings that combination of data together. One, 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 one. It goes on to number two, it finds the third and fourth row in the second table, and brings those rows together. For Elaine, he's ID three, there are no grades, so it doesn't bring anything back there. Likewise, in the grades column, there's a student four who we haven't defined anywhere, and it doesn't bring that back either. The inner being, it's all the places where only there's a direct match. Code-wise, this is what it'll look like. In the, in the table that I actually brought back was select star from students, join grades on students.id equals grades.student. And we talked about that earlier, where when you're using database columns, but you have multiple tables to work with, as long as the fields are unique, you don't necessarily have to specify the table name, but it's good practice to always specify table name dot column name, just to be explicit about where those columns are actually coming from. So we can see this in code. I'll skip the part of the code that's repetitive. And you can see I've plugged in exactly the, the SQL statement that we just saw at the very top, select star from students, join grades, on students.id equals grades.student. And we can just go ahead and run this. This is relatively straightforward here. And you'll see that we actually get the same data set, the, the one difference being the ID column is back in its first position rather than in the middle of the table. So, what about this case where we, the inner join isn't giving us all the data we need? Now we can start looking at left and right outer joins. So the left join, we're starting with the same two tables. I've left them physically in the same space. So students is the left table, grades is the right table. Now what do folks think the difference is here versus what we talked about with inner joins? Okay, so the difference is what we're saying when we specify a left join is that every re record in the left table, whether it has a corresponding record in the right table, needs to be displayed. So in the last example, Elaine didn't get, ex get listed because he didn't have any grades. But now we're saying that absolutely has to happen. So that data set will come back looking like this we'll suddenly have these null fields because there is no record to go with it. Now, who can think of a situation wh where this might be useful? Sure. In this very case right here, where some person comes in and doesn't have all the information but needs to be displayed to see all the students. Exactly. So, as was just said, in the case where we still need to see all the students, so if I have a class list and I need to see who hasn't been turning in their homework, I need to know who all my students are, whether or not they've actually earned any grades. So let's go ahead and jump over to the SQL statement. Nearly the same as the last example, 
The one subtle difference is the addition of the word left right before the word join to explicitly say that, yes, we're doing this left outer join. As a side note, you could actually include the word outer, but it's optional, and I didn't feel like the extra typing. So coming back to real code, oh. The same idea, we've just added the left to the SQL statement. And uh, as I prematurely ran it, you'll see that the actual output is just as we had predicted it would be. Now I think I'm actually gonna, for time's sake, skip PD05. As you might guess, PD05 is the right join, which is essentially the same as the left join, except you're saying that the right table is the dominant table and no matter what, you want to include the records from that table, regardless of whether there's data that corresponds in the left table. So I can actually run that just to demonstrate the output that we would expect there. Where we get this mystery student four, we see their grades come through but we don't actually see any name information because they're not in our student's table. All right. The other type of join that's out there is this full outer join. And basically the idea is we're saying that both tables are equally important, and we need every record from both tables, no matter what. So, quite simply, we want this output, which is the combination of both. We have the student that doesn't have any grades, we've got the grades that don't seem to have any student, and we need all the data to come back. The reason I put a little asterisk on this one, full outer join, is it's not actually supported by MySQL. So although it is an available option in certain databases, it's not one that we will be working with. So this is an example where if we're using PDO and we've, you know, we've got these standardized PHP statements now, we might be using a database at one point that supports a function, but then we switch to another database and that functionality is no longer available. So something to be in the back of your mind when you do change databases, if you do change. All right. The next new SQL feature that I want to talk about is commit. So basically, the idea of commit, or transactions in general, is that we want to specify that either all the commands need to happen or none of them should happen. This whole uh, atomic operations. Specifically in MySQL, we need to specify InnoDB as our database type to get this functionality. But then we can start doing commands like start transaction and then either commit or rollback. And everything that happens between those two points will happen as one complete operation. So, this is very rough code, this is not tested, this is just to give you an idea of what something might look like. So we've got a for each where we're looking at balances for user ID equals one. Not my cleanest code, I wouldn't recommend putting this in production anywhere. But I'm taking the balance by getting the balance out of the row and I'm gonna add 100 to it. And then I wanna execute this, update the user, set the balance to this new value. Now, what's potentially bad about this? Sure. Change user goes and runs this twice to try and get their balance up to 200. Right. So the, the problem is the case where the user tries to run this twice in parallel. And then, you know, what's the right value? If I'm supposed to add 100 in both cases, which update gets put in when? Do they only get $100? Do they end up with their full $200? We don't really know because it's there's an opportunity between each statement for execution to pause and move on to another process. 
So what we wind up doing is using these commands. So because this is so well known, this idea of transactions, PDO actually supports it natively. So it's got a begin transaction command that you can send to your database handle, and a commit and also rollback, as you might guess, commands that you can put in directly into your code. So let's see that with some real code. All right, so one thing I, just as a quick note, is I've packaged up this little function at the top here, just so I can run it multiple times. What it's gonna do is show me the results, or the, the current state of my grades table, so that we can see how things are going along as we make changes. So I'll start off at the beginning. Before the update, I'll just print the grades. So we have a, a baseline. Then I can begin a transaction, and I can update the grades, and I can say, for student one, me, I'm gonna bump up my grades to A minus. You know, I only had B and B plus before, but you know, I got the curve, so I'm excited now, I got my A minuses. And I'm gonna commit those changes to the database. Then, using my powers as a teaching fellow, I'm gonna say that, you know, I don't think David necessarily did as well as he thought he did. And I'm gonna bring Dave Malin's grades down to an A minus from the A's that he had previously. But I'm gonna wrap that in a transaction as well. So as soon as I update the values, I'm gonna query the database and see what things look like. But then I'm gonna have regrets, and I'm gonna actually roll back that transaction and then look at the database again. So we've got three points, before I do anything, after I've manipulated my grades but committed them, and then updated David's grades but not yet determined whether to commit or roll back in the very end of the application. So let's see what happens there. So we've got a whole full screen of stuff here. But you can see before we started, the grades were B, B plus, A, A, C, as we had seen before. I had my two updates. The one that I committed for myself that updated the first two lines to be A minuses, and then the uncommitted or rolled back changes that updated lines three and four and left those at A minus. But then I had my regrets, I rolled back, and David was once again returned to his A's. So all this code, is actually up on Bitbucket for you. I'll uh, make sure I get the, the URL out as part of uh, getting it posted with our standard location in the uh, section code. Um, yeah, so any basic questions about the, the basic ideas of PDO so far? All right, great, let's uh, move on to the walkthrough. So our new project is CS75 Finance. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the architecture, a little bit what you might th think about for database design, show you a little bit about how we actually do these Yahoo stock quotes, and then talk about other considerations that you might wanna think about as you work on your project. Just as a, yeah. Just as a quick overview of the Yahoo stock, stock quotes, you can actually go out to Yahoo with these URLs, going to quotes.csv, and do queries. So in this case, I'm searching for Google and Yahoo quotes with this little magical SNL1. And I've broken that out. There's actually, if you go to this gummystuff.org site, they've got a, must be about 30 different parameters that you can pass in here. S specifically says, show me the symbol. N says specifically, show me the name and L1 says, show me the last trade for the stock. So this query would actually bring back a CSV file that has that information for both Google and Yahoo. But let's, with that background, get on to the live demo. All right.
So let's start at the beginning. I'm, I'm sticking with this whole MVC concept and sort of expanding on what David had done. So I've got an, a .htaccess file. This looks a little bit different than the one we had used before, but um, some basic ideas really haven't changed. I'm still turning the rewrite engine on. I'm specifically using a rewrite base of just slash now because I'm actually going to work in our project one directory as opposed to one of the MVC slash seven slash et cetera directories that David's been working with. The third line is just going to say if the URI is index.php, ignore it. Otherwise, I do this rewrite. For simplicity, for simplicity tonight, all you really need to know is I'm capturing two parameters that end up being called one and three. And it's getting turned into index.php question mark page equals the first parameter and param equals the second parameter. So if I have a URL that's project one slash home, it's going to go to index.php question mark page equals home and param equals nothing. But if I want to go to a page that's project one slash quote slash g-o-o-g, I can say go to the index.php question mark page equals quote, param equals g-o-o-g, and then presumably actually get a stock quote for Google based on that URL. From .ht access, we uh, jump over to index.php. which is just taking these parameters and deciding what controller to load. So if the page is set, it's going to use that as the name of my controller. And it's actually going to load that file, ultimately, through this require statement. If it's not set, it's going to default to home as the page. So no matter what, people end up at my home page unless they know where they're going. I'll leave, leave it to, as an exercise to uh, sort through the rest of that, but it's basically just the dispatcher for MVC at this point. The other magical piece is actually code that I took pretty much straight from David. And that's this render function that he had which basically is for rendering my views. So a controller can say, render with this template and this data. The data is automatically expanded from an associative array into a series of actual variables using the extract command. And uh, although my name is on the top of this, this really is uh, essentially David's work, almost unchanged. So given all of that, I've come to this MVC model again. This is my controller for home. This is the base page that I go to. It includes that helper function, so it knows how to actually render views afterward. And basically, all it's going to do is look at my current session, see if a user ID has been set, and then decide which view do, does the user get to see. Do they get to see the home page, or do they actually have to go to a login page? And you can see where we're actually getting to the point where using this model view controller architecture, potentially things are very straightforward to look at. I've got all about five functioning lines of code hey Peter, that handles the entire controller for this page. All right, and let's see what some of those view components look like so we can put the pieces together. So one of the ones that we just saw referred to is this login.php. And this is where things are actually getting a little more interesting. You'll notice we hadn't really seen any HTML yet. But now that we're in the view, it's the right time to start seeing the HTML code appear. So I'm going to render a header. And we'll look at that shortly. Um, but then I'm going to start putting things together. So I want people to actually log in. So it sounds like I need a form. 
I've just created two fields for now, an email address and a password, but that sort of fits with the spec that we're working with for this project. And then I've started adding a little more. So we haven't really started talking about JavaScript yet, but I wanted to have some placeholders in the example as uh, we get to that in the coming days here. So I've done two little things. This validate form, which just a short explanation. Basically, what I'd like to do is before the user even takes a trip out to the web server to do any work, I want to start doing some work on the client side to make sure that things are OK before I even go through the effort. So this very, very short example of validate form, all it's going to do is look at the fields that have been filled in. It's only going to look at the email field. And what I want to do is just check that at least six characters have been entered. The idea being, if you were able to get the address x at x.to, that was the shortest email address I could think of that was possibly going to be valid. So if you hadn't put in at least six characters, I, I didn't want to worry about it. The explanation of this will start coming Wednesday as we uh, get into JavaScript and jQuery. This is just here for uh, as you move forward with the project. The other little tweak that you'll see in here is this statement here input name equals email dot focus. Basically, when the page first loads, the cursor doesn't have any focus. This is ultimately going to say, move the cursor into that email field so the person can start typing. Again, another one of those details you don't have to worry about tonight, but uh, a little preview for what you might start seeing on Wednesday. And then lastly, we'll include the footer. So basically, all this, this template has done is created a form on the screen. And I can actually uh, show you what that looks like, just so you have a, a little sample. This is actually that page. We saw the email address. You see it actually has focus right now. We saw the password. We saw the login button as part of the form. There's also this little link home page at the top, which we hadn't seen yet. That's actually going to come out of the standard header. So this should look relatively straightforward, except for the one line that says script. And again, that's as we start getting into uh, JavaScript on Wednesday, that line will make sense. But otherwise, you'll see I'm opening my HTML, my head, plugging in the title using the same approach that David had used the last time he did MVC. And I've created one link at the top of the body there that says, if you click on home page, it's just going to go to slash on the site, which translates to HTTP colon slash slash project one slash. All this code is also up on my Bitbucket account. So when that link is published on the home page for the class, you'll also have access to all of this to review as well. And the footer is uh, even less convoluted, all I'm doing is closing my basic tags. The other option, if the user was already logged into the site, I wanted to show them a little information on the site. So I've just got a few sample links just to get things started here. You might think about how you might build out this project later to include more details here. I've specifically hard-coded that you can request a quote for Google. Obviously, for your project, you'd want some more flexibility than just one stock symbol. Um, I've provided a link so I can actually view my portfolio. And I've provided the opportunity to log out. You'll want to start thinking about things like, how will they buy a stock? How will they sell a stock? Do you need separate pages for those? If someone's at a quote page already, is that the time to buy? Or do you want a separate purchase page? If they're already looking at their portfolio, is that the time to sell stocks? Or should there be a separate page for selling? Some design considerations you can start thinking about there. All right. All right. So let's start looking at something real. Let's, let's get a quick view of what the start of the portfolio might look like. All 
All right, so the portfolio controller. If I click up my portfolio link, what is the controller going to do? The controller really just wants to talk to the model and pass any information out to the view controller. So basically, this ends up being relatively straightforward. If the user's logged in, session user ID is set, then I'm going to get the user ID from the session. So you can think about how we've in the past used the session and stored a variable in there. Somewhere I must be storing this value. Then I'm going to get the user's holdings. And this is just one call out to the model in this approach. Your holdings is just get user shares for your user ID, and then we use render to throw it out to the view. So the controller ends up just being the glue in this case. All it knows is I want to talk to the model to get the data, and as soon as I have it, I don't want to think anything about HTML. I just want to get it off to the view to deal with. So this ends up being the entire controller, relatively straightforward. One thing I'll point out here, you know, we've already seen one other place in my code where I check if the session user ID is set. Perhaps I'm not doing the right thing here. Do I really want to check that on every single page? Is that a helper function that should be caught at a higher level? Things like that that you can consider. I don't know that I want to have to remember to, in every file, cut and paste the same is set session user ID, and if not, render login. All right, so to get to the real meat of all this, we finally make it down to the model again. This is the same model that we had looked at just shortly ago when we were looking at an example of how we used to do things, these MySQL statements. I've left this in there. This is basically one of the approaches that we've used in class for authenticating a user against your database, where you take the idea of selecting by email and password. If you get a row, the user's had the right password and has a valid account, and you can use that to log them in. But at the moment, we're talking about portfolio. So let's actually go forward a little further and, and get a sense of what something like this might start to look like. So with the portfolio, a user has some collection of stocks. They have some cash balance. I'm going down to a very basic example here, and I'm only going to look at what stocks they have. So you'll want to think about how do you expand this as you start devel developing the project to include everything that truly belongs in a user's portfolio. So we've, we've got our new PDO syntax. We're connecting to the host, selecting the database, log in with the username and password, all basically in those first two lines of code. Then we're going to prepare a statement. Because the user ID is coming from somewhere else, I like the idea of the prepared statement here. It's going to protect me. It's going to do that wrapper of making sure that anything that needs to be escaped is escaped. So I'm going to bind that value in, and then I can execute the query. Once the query executes, I'm going to get back a result set. For each of the rows that I get, I'm going to do Instead of doing the for each approach like last time, I actually took a different approach. I'm using this statement and a fetch to get each row that was returned. And as I get them, I'm just going to push those results into an array so I can return it. So what is this going to look like? We're selecting symbols and shares. So we're basically going to end up with an array set that is for each row in the array, I'm going to have the symbol in a value, the shares in a value in an associative array. So an array of associative arrays. And I'm just going to return that to the users. If the statement didn't execute, my database handle just goes to null. And uh, you'll see I return no data. So does this basic idea of how I might go out to the database using PDO, select a few rows, and return an array back to the controller vaguely makes sense. Are there any questions about it? All right, no questions yet. So 
So once we've gotten this, we already saw that the controller is really just passing it along. So we can jump right over to the view. So what are we doing with all this data that we've got? I've decided that I'm actually going to make a small table. It's going to have two columns. I'm using that table heading to uh, bold those two, the headers on the two columns. So it's just symbols and shares. I'm going to loop over the array that had been passed back directly as they'd come right out of the model. And for each one, I'm going to use HTML special cares to clean it up, but basically put it in a uh, table data within the table rows, pulling things out by the names because I've got these associative arrays inside there. And that is roughly it, relatively straightforward here before I put the footer on. So let me show you what that actually looks like just to give you some context. I'm going to uh, jump ahead and actually log in so I can do a view portfolio. So apparently in the database, this user had two actual holdings. One was the symbol Goog for 10 shares. One was the symbol for Yahoo with 100 shares. In fact, that's not the real symbol for Yahoo. That, that was a typo when I created the data. But basically, very straightforward. And if we look at the page source, you'll see that the page, oh, I really haven't gotten too complex with my code here. All right. So the one other thing I wanted to show you was what David just started alluding to at the end of class as well, and that is the quotes. So we can look at the controller for quotes. This is, again, very short code because all the work is really being done by the model and view. Basically, I'm going to say, if a param was passed in, I'm going to call this get quote data with the parameter URL encoded. Oh, I didn't realize I'd done that there. And then whatever comes back, I'm passing directly out to the view for rendering. So let's see what's really going on in the model here. All right. So this code probably looks very familiar. It's very similar to what David just showed a few minutes ago. I'm uh, being passed in a symbol. I'm creating a result array just to store things in. Nothing in there yet. And I've got this URL to actually connect to Yahoo. The one special piece of data that I've plugged in is the symbol that was actually passed in. Let me get the pointer. So I've got the symbol here. I've also specified this, which we saw in the slides earlier, that S, L1, and N. S being the symbol, L1 being the last trade value, and N being the name. What I want to do then is I can actually open this URL as if it was a file directly with the fopen command. Once I've got a handle to that file, CSV is one of the things that PHP actually knows how to work with. So I can, one row at a time, use fget CSV to pull the CSV data directly into uh, rows that I can work with. If the row, row value one in this case, is set, then I know I've got data. I found a last traded value. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create an associative array with the symbol set to the first parameter, which we saw was the symbol. The last trade set to the second parameter, which we saw that L1 is the last trade. And the name set to the third parameter, which was that N from the 
from the URL that we used. I've set this up specifically so it just pulls down a single symbol at a time, although the APIs do allow us to pull down multiples. And that's something that you'll want to consider as well. In this case, I really was only concerned about returning one result. But when you're working later, say for example, you're going to be generating the value of someone's portfolio. Does it make sense for each stock symbol to take another trip out to the Yahoo server to get that quote, that symbol's price? Or do you want to bunch them up and get a number of symbols back in one shot? So you might get five or 10 current stock prices from Yahoo in a single transaction rather than doing multiple transactions. So things to consider there. Once I've got the data, I close my handle and I return. And that data can then be passed off to the view. So one little tweak you'll see at the top of this file that I haven't done in other files is it's possible to call this page and not have valid data come back. So either someone picked a stock symbol that didn't exist or Yahoo service was unavailable and I just couldn't get data at the moment. It's possible that things will go wrong. So I've got some notification to the user if no data has come into the view that either the symbol wasn't provided or the quote data wasn't found. But assuming that I do actually get my data back, I've done a, a short table again, scrolling off the bottom of the screen here. And following the same template as I did with portfolio, I'm just taking the three pieces of data, putting them into that table row, and uh, closing out the table on the screen. And I can show you what that looks like as well. So very straightforward little table, just the symbol name and last trade, and the data is pulled directly from the model, passed through the controller, and displayed on the view here. So that was the code I was going to review tonight. Um, there's one other file in there. You'll see it's called uh, pwdhash.php. If you try to log in and your login credentials aren't valid, it will actually show you the password hash of whatever you just tried to log in with, so that until you actually write your register function, you can uh, find out what the password is and you can push them into the database. So you can actually keep moving along with your coding before you finish all your code. Um, so a few things. I, I wanted to make sure that I got some design considerations out there for you. I've mentioned a few as we went. Uh, we talked about how many connections should you make out to Yahoo when you're trying to calculate the value of a portfolio. So something to think about there. Is it multiple connections, single connections? What happens if the user actually tries to sell stocks from two different browsers simultaneously? What do you want to do about that? Um, what happens if the user buys additional shares of a stock that they already own? And David hinted strongly at how you might consider that earlier in the lecture tonight. As we get into the JavaScript, you'll want to start thinking about what validation do you want to do on the browser and what validation do you want to do on the server. If the user hasn't entered a password at all, you can probably save yourself a trip to the server and validate on the browser. But if you manage to get past that check or the user doesn't run JavaScript, you probably still need to confirm some things on the server side as well, possibly the same things that you thought you were confirming on the browser side. So something to think about as we go into Wednesday there. And uh, one other thing that isn't obvious, but if you look at my code, this page is available right now, this quote slash goog. But if I log out of the application, that page is still actually visible. So think about things like this. Does it make sense for me to be able to still look up quotes even if I'm not logged into the application? Or should all the pages, or what subset of the pages should be restricted to just authenticated users? So this is a few thoughts I had to, uh, to inspire you as you work through this. Are there uh, any questions on the project so far? Just as a quick reminder, I'll be sticking around for office hours for as long as folks need tonight. And um, 
One of the TFs will be doing online office hours at 8, but certainly any questions right now, I'm happy to answer. All right, well, I thank everyone for their time. I thanks to the, uh, the folks watching this uh, remotely. And uh, good luck. Remember to uh, watch for our posting on how to submit your Project Zero tomorrow so that we can get those submitted Wednesday. Thanks. Good night, everyone.